Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. This is Fred Briscoe. Continental Insurance Company? That's right. In Boston, Mass. Yes. Well, it's nice to hear your voice again, Freddie. Only why doesn't somebody call me from somewhere where it's nice and warm this time of year? Well, uh, I have a little insurance problem that's been making things pretty hot for me. Well, tell me all. Uh, run on over here to Boston, I will. Okay. And uh, better come prepared. Prepared? What I mean is, well, I may be all wrong, but well, you usually carry a gun, don't you? Well, of course. I... Oh. Yes. I see. Yes, Johnny. <laughs> CBS Radio brings you Bob Reddick in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Insurance Company Boston office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the paperback mystery matter. I decided it might be smart to have my own car along, so expense account item one is 420 for a tank full of gas. And less than four hours after I talked with Fred Briscoe on the phone, I was in his office on Commonwealth Avenue there in Boston. And then, over a lunch at the famous old Union Oyster House... Is that another half dozen on the half shell, Johnny? Oh, are you kidding? But I sure love the seafood in this town of yours. Who doesn't? Ah, but I certainly wish Mr. Gerson would get here. I ought to be back at the office. Gerson, that's your client? Yes, Henry R. Gerson. He wants to tell you all about his worries himself. And I'm sure the only reason he insisted on meeting us here was to catch a free lunch. Oh, that kind, huh? Johnny, that old crook is worth millions. Though you'd never know it by the way he lives and dresses, by that ramshackle old apartment he lives in. You said crook? I did. Every penny that old miser ever got hold of, and still has for the most part, came from some dirty deal that he put over on somebody, which makes him one of the most hated people I've ever known. And just as soon as he made a new friend, he'd proceed to take him, but royally. A oh, real nice guy, huh? Mm -hmm. What sort of deals does he make? Well, he doesn't anymore. The last 10 or 15 years, he just sat around counting his money and gloating over the fact that he can keep a couple of poor, resentful nephews and niece from getting their hands on it until he dies. And they're Gerson's heirs? Only because they're his only living relatives. And they're poor? Yes. And, uh, well, I'm afraid I'll have to admit that they deserve to be. Up until their parents died and left them with no money, no nothing, Jerry and Paul had planned to study for the ministry. But now, Mr. Gerson tells me that they're just drifters. One job after another, and never on a job long enough to pay their bills. They live in Syracuse, New York. Just waiting for the old man to die. Right. So he has no use for them. And the niece? Her name is Nancy Trimmer. Lives here in town. Works as a checker at one of the supermarkets when they don't catch her shortchanging the customers. And... I guess she'd just as leaf help the old man into his grave as the other two. Nice people. Yeah. But no worse than Gerson himself. So he's worried that one of them may try to knock him off. Yeah, that's it, John. Uh oh, here he comes. Don't let on to him that I told you anything at all about I the... thought I told you that I'd tell him. Oh, hello there, Mr. Gerson. <laughs> so you're Johnny Dollar, eh? That's right, Mr. Gerson. Well, you don't look like much to me. And you think you can keep those worthless young relatives of mine from murdering me? get their hands on my money? Well, suppose you sit down, sir, and tell me what makes you think they might try it. Think? I know it. I've got proof of it. All the proof I need. Oh, what kind of proof? Go on, you... move over, Briscoe, and let me sit down. Oh, uh, certainly, sir. The least that insurance company of yours can do is to buy me a square meal. Why, of course, I'd be glad to. After all, I give the company over a thousand a year in premiums on my life insurance, don't I? Uh, something like that. Eleven hundred and twenty-four dollars and twelve cents every year. And the only reason I haven't tried to cash it in is because you'd give me back less than half of what I put into well, it. Well, now, that isn't... All right, true, all it? right, let it go. Uh, what's the face value of the policy, Fred? Uh, 47000 double indemnity. And if those crooked nephews of mine get away with whatever they're up to, that's the way it'll get paid to them, double. But if you're leaving them the rest of your estate... What? 
Well, this insurance money is only a drop in the bucket. Oh, it is, huh? Well, you know something? I'd commit suicide just to cut them out of it. You hear me? And have all those $1,100 premiums paid out for nothing? Hey. I take it there is the usual suicide clause in the policy? Yes. All right, all right. We've been all over that now. The thing you got to do, Dolly, is to keep me from getting murdered. Uh, now, wait just a minute. Yeah, yeah. Now, you talk about uh, being perfectly willing to commit suicide. That's right. And yet you sit here and demand protection to keep you alive. Now, that doesn't make sense, does it? Don't you get smart now. Wait till I tell you what's been going on. I suppose you do. Well, later, 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 after I get some food in me. Waiter, waiter, bring me a menu. <laughs> What a crackpot. And he packed away the food as though it were to be his last meal on earth. And he refused to talk further about his problem until he was finished and the bill was paid. By Fred Briscoe, of course. Even then, when I asked him once more about whatever it was that had him worried... Here, in a public place like this, where everybody in town might hear me? You think they don't now? What's that? What did you say? Uh, nothing, nothing. You think I want to stay around here in town with my life in danger? I'm going to take you out to my place where I'm safe. You got any objection? Whatever you say, Mr. Gerson. If you can foresee the end of international tension, you're more of an optimist than most people. It's understandable that all of our citizens like to keep in touch with latest global developments. CBS News, meeting this American need to know, has expanded its worldwide coverage for longer, stronger reports, reviews, and commentary. Expanded CBS News on CBS Radio. The first word in speed, the last word for accuracy, daily at this address. <laughs> sense. If it was perfectly safe for old Mr. Gerson to wander in town and meet us at the Oyster House, why this sudden urge to get on back to his place and lock himself in? Anyhow, after telling Fred Briscoe I'd check with him later, I drove Gerson to his apartment. It was in a wholly undesirable section that I hadn't even known existed. Are there railroad tracks out in back of this place? You know, what's the matter with you? Can't you hear? Well, if you'll pardon me for saying it, Mr. Well, Gerson, yes, well, I yes. got the idea from Fred that you were pretty well off. I am. Of course I am. And yet you live in a dingy place like this, in a neighborhood like this? Is there any reason why I shouldn't? Waste not, want not is my rule. Sure, I got money, plenty of it. A couple of million, if you want to know. That's no reason I got to throw it away on high living, is it? Two locks on the door? That's right. And double locks on the windows. I put them on myself. Even nailed up the transom there over the door. As long as I'm here, I'm safe. You sure are. I got plenty of food in there. And if I run out of it before you can put a stop to all this nonsense, well, you can bring me some more. Well, now, you still haven't told me. All right, all right. Sit down, Dollar, now. I'll tell you why I know that one of my nephews, or well, maybe it's my niece, why one of them is going to try and kill me. And just to get their dirty hands on my money. Uh, you, you sit on the chair now, sit on the bed. Well? Look. Ah, look here. If these aren't proof, if these warnings aren't proof they're going to kill me, I'd like to know what it is. Philippians 2.12. Yes, that's from the Bible. You know your Bible? Well, I'm afraid I don't recognize that part. Well, I looked it up. And you know what it says in that chapter and verse? It says, work out. Your own salvation. Well, I'd hardly call that a threat. I would. And the second one came in the mail. Same neat kind of typing. No name signed on them. Where were they mailed from? Over in Syracuse, New York, where my nephews live. And look at this one. Isaiah 38, 1. That's 38 chapter, first verse. Set thine house in order. I thought you didn't know the Bible. Well, I remember that because it was used in a threatening letter a few years ago out in Chicago. So, you see, you see what I mean? And this one, Revelations 2.10, says, Be thou faithful unto death. So I should be faithful to them, eh? Huh? Keep my promise to leave them all I got, huh? Mr. Gerson. And this one, Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. That's right. Sin 
just because I, I, I let them starve a bit when their folks died and they didn't have anybody to turn to. And you didn't give them any help? Why should I? Couldn't they get out and use their brains the way I had to? They won't get any help from me. Not while I'm alive. But you're still keeping them in your will. What's the matter with you? Don't you see? That's where they've got me. They're all the relatives I got. If I don't will it, then the state will give it to them anyhow. There's nothing to keep you from giving your money to charity. Charity? Me? Not on your life. So I've got to leave it to them. But I'm not going to let one of them kill me. Not if, if you can help it. You see what I mean? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that's what you're getting paid for, isn't it? Yeah. Listen, boy, now either you lock up those rotten kids and throw a scare in them that'll keep them from murdering me, or else you've got to stay here and protect me. Now, wait a minute. These quotations from the Bible... I tell you, they're threats. That's as plain as, as the nose on your face. Now, didn't Fred say that one of the boys had planned to study for the ministry? The ministry, fooey. What boy in his right mind would ever spend his whole life... Sure. Sure. That proves the notes came from one of those boys. Which one? Well, how should I know? They both had that crazy preacher idea up till the folks died off. Well, then I guess I'd better look them up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Then you come back here and look after me. Because while you're gone, I'm staying locked up tight here in this apartment. You do that. This old man was either a nut or up to something. But what? And I had to admit those unsigned notes pointing out passages in the scriptures could possibly have been taken as threats. And since both the nephews had planned to study for the ministry... But first, I called on the niece, Nancy Trimmer, because I hoped that she'd know enough about the nephews to be able to tell me if her suspicion about them was justified. Her rooms in the southeast corner of town were a little better than her uncle's. And most of our conversation, uh, her conversation, took place in the kitchen. Now, look, are you from the parole, Mr., uh, what'd you say your name is? A dollar, Johnny Dollar. Yeah, well, just leave me alone, see? So maybe I did make a little mistake helping myself to some of the groceries and that job I had before. Uh, Miss Trimmer. But this new job, I'm playing it straight and I'm keeping my skirts clean. Yes, I'm sure you are. Gee, that's a laugh, keeping your skirts clean, sweeping out the back end of a warehouse. Look, what I mean is, why don't you guys leave me alone, huh? Why you got to come around here checking up on me? But I'm not. Persecution, that... What do you mean you're not? I represent your Uncle Henry's insurance company. Oh, yeah? Well, I don't want any insurance, so get out of here and leave me cook my supper. Uh, not even his insurance? If he dies? What's that? I said... Hey, sure. Me, I'll grab anything I can of that old skin flint's insurance or anything else I can get my hands on. So, uh... Maybe you got some idea how to make him die real quick? Well, apparently somebody has. He's been getting threats against his life. Yeah? Well, I hope whoever it is means it. You know who's doing it? No, not yet. That's why I'd like to ask you some questions. Yeah? What about? About your cousins, Jerry and Paul. Listen, you want to know anything about them, you look them up in Syracuse, New York. Ask them and leave me alone so as I can fix my supper and... Yeah, then curl up with a book and improve my mind, just like Paul and Jerry always said I ought to. Now, look, Miss Trimmer... Those preachers, huh? Well, the only preaching I ever got from them was I ought to read up and educate myself. Well, maybe that's not such a bad idea. Oh, yeah? You think I don't read? I read a lot. You see them in there? All those books? You mean all these paperbacks? So what's the matter with reading that stuff? You want to know the truth? The only reason I sit around here with them every night is account I can't afford to buy a lot of fancy clothes and be out on the town with a lot of fancy sports like you. Miss Trimmer, if you'll stop talking well, for a I minute, I... Well, I don't like sports like you anyhow. All I like is me, see? I like my company better. So if you'll just get out of here and leave me alone. Uh, then you're not interested in the threats against your uncle? Not unless somebody carries him out. Now will you leave me alone? <laughs> balls in one day. Yeah, and I wondered about the nephews in Syracuse. But if I had to see him, I had to see him. Item two, ten cents for a phone call to Fred Briscoe. And I told him what I'd learned, or hadn't learned, 
Yeah, I know how you feel, Johnny, but if those are meant to be threats... So I'd better grab a plane and call on those nephews, Jerry and Paul. You know their address? Old man Gerson gave it to me. Good. And uh, you think he's perfectly safe there alone, huh? I could call the police in on this. Not even the police could get into this apartment of his without busting down the door, so don't worry about him. I'll see you when I get back. Okay, Johnny. You know something? I should never have hung up that phone and flown to Syracuse. I should never have left old man Gerson alone there in his apartment. Don't worry about him. Huh? Probably the wrongest thing I ever said in my life. Tobacco, the better it tastes, and in Commander, the tobacco is vacuum cleaned. Have a Commander! Welcome aboard! Try new king size Philip Morris Commanders, made on a new machine, the Mark 8, that takes rich, full flavored tobacco and gently vacuum cleans it. And the cleaner the tobacco, the better it tastes. Noticeably better. The cleaner the tobacco, the better it tastes. And in Commander, the tobacco is vacuum cleaned. Have a Commander! Welcome aboard! Item three... 95 cents for a cheese sandwich and a cup of coffee at the Logan International Airport. That was my dinner. Item four, 1990, plane fare to Syracuse. Item five, 650 for a cab from Hancock Field to the first floor apartment out near Sunnycrest Park, where Paul and Jerry Gerson lived. No, I'm Paul, Mr. Dollar. Jerry isn't here. Oh, where is he? Well, to be honest about it, I don't know, but he said he mightn't be back tonight. Oh, he did? But, uh, come in, sir. Thank you. From Uncle Henry's insurance company, did you say? That's right. Oh. Sit down, please. All right. You and Jerry stand to collect quite a bit when your uncle dies, don't you? We don't want it, Mr. Dollar. Oh, you don't? Oh, it's been tough, sir. I, I won't pretend it hasn't. But Jerry and I have finally earned enough to continue with our studies for the ministry. So we'd have no use for this, uh... Well, maybe it sounds a little corny, sir, but... That's tainted money. The only way Uncle Henry ever got any money was by cheating people. We don't want any of it. No, it's a very pretty speech, Paul. I beg your pardon, sir? When did Jerry leave? Well, it was right after Mr. Fred Briscoe over in Boston phoned to say you'd be here and that well, when you... Fred told you I was coming here? Yes, sir, and he said to please have you phone him, sir. Oh, excuse me, sir. Oh, great. No wonder I'm getting all this pretty talk. Hello? Oh, oh, yes, sir. He's right here. It's for you, Mr. Dollar. For me? It's Mr. Briscoe. Oh, it is? Fred? Johnny. It's all over. What was the big idea of telling these kids that... What did you say? In spite of all his locked doors and windows, Mr. Gerson is dead. Hold the phone. All right, Paul. Make a move. Mr. Dollar, that gun, sir. And maybe you better start remembering where your brother went. But, sir. Johnny? Everything's under control, Fred. Well, I'm not sure I know what you mean, because, you see, Mr. Gerson's death was suicide. What? The police are certain of it. Well, they are, are they? Well, I have some other ideas. You have? Hi, Paul. What? Jerry. After getting through with the library, I decided to come back here. After all... What, what does this mean? This man at the phone with a gun. Jerry. Johnny? You have some other ideas? Maybe so, maybe no. So Jerry's sudden appearance knocked everything into a cocked hat. And then the boys' reaction to their uncle's death, their repeated, completely honest assertion that they wanted none of his money. Well, I ended up apologizing to him. But then item six is 180. 
for a call back to Fred. And I tell you, there's no question about it, Johnny. The landlord woke up, smelled the gas, called the police emergency squad. They arrived, broke down the door, and there he lay in bed. In his nightshirt, dead as a doornail. Gas from that heater there in his bedroom? Yeah, and the windows were still closed and locked, so it couldn't have blown out. And all those locks on the door? Locked. So nobody else could possibly have gotten into the room and turned on the gas. In other words, suicide. Okay, Fred, I... No, wait. Yeah? Was anybody around there to see him after I left him? Well, when I talked with his niece, Nancy Trimmer... Yeah? She told me she'd gone around to beg some money from him earlier. She did, huh? Said that uh, he'd acted very strangely. Fred... And much to her surprise, he gave her some money, and then she left. Then she did it. What? That was no suicide. She murdered him. No, Johnny. That was long before he could have got to bed and turned on the gas. And nobody else could possibly have done it. Any bets? Meet me at the airport. <laughs> Item 7 is 2640 for a cab. Hancock Field, plane fare, back to Boston. All because of those paperbacks that I'd seen strewn around her apartment. Fred met me at Logan International. It was shortly after dawn. And then, a few minutes later... Come on, come and just leave me get a robe on. Oh, you... Hey, wait a minute! There it is, Fred, What's look. What's idea coming in here well, like Johnny, that? Johnny, here's what? This mystery magazine. I saw it when I came in here before. Jack Johnstone writes for it now and then. Johnstone? The man who dramatizes all these cases of mine. And here, here's his story in it. Death by Jet. Listen, you mind telling me what you're... Death by Jet? Nancy here didn't know that I'm a special investigator. Investigator? But my talk about her uncle's money she'd get reminded her of this story. She figured this was the answer, so why waste time? Let me have that magazine. Sure, sure. Go ahead, tear it up. It's too late now. Which I am afraid I still don't that understand. That story, death by jet, that means a gas jet. Huh? Another of those locked room mysteries. And it gave her the idea for killing her uncle without getting caught. Or so she thought. You don't know what you're talking about. But what kind of an idea? In the basement of that dingy building where he lived. She got in there and turned off the gas line to his apartment. Now, listen. Then she went on upstairs to see him. When he wasn't looking, she opened the valve on that gas heater in the bedroom. You're crazy. And then she left and waited until he had time to get to sleep. The whole procedure is in that story. I get it. When he was asleep, she went back to the basement. Right. And reopened the gas line. And if we check, I think we'll find she didn't have sense enough to wipe her fingerprints off that valve down there. Oh, yeah? Well, that's where you're wrong, because I did wipe them off. I wiped them off so clean that neither you or any... Buddy, hell. Yeah. Want to call the police, Fred? So it looks as though the boys will get the old man's fortune, whether they want it or not, and his insurance. Build a lot of fine churches with money like that. Expense account total, call it, oh, call it 70 bucks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, proof that a man's best laid plans can really go awry. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Reddick, is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Heard in our cast were Edgar Staley as Mr. Gerson, Terry Keene as Nancy Trimmer, Ralph Camargo as Fred Briscoe, John Thomas as Paul, Richard Holland as Jerry. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hanna speaking. A great many auto accidents are caused by excess speed. You may be in a big hurry to get somewhere, but that extra 10 or 15 miles per hour that you drive will only save you a few minutes at most, and it may cost you your life.